So I thought for today I would do Gerard Manley Hopkins, Felix Randall. Um, I'm going to try and keep it short, but I will struggle. Um, I love Gerard Manley Hopkins poetry. It's it's difficult. I find it incredibly hard to unpack. It takes me multiple readings. Um, but the sounds of his work are magnificent. I just, yeah, I fall in love with the sound of his words every time I hear them. As with the other poetry videos that I've done, I'm going to do some background on Gerard Manley Hopkins, a little bit of background on Felix Randall because he is based on a real person, look at the structure of the poem, look at the basic idea of the poem, look at the vocab because the vocab is rough, it's, it's hard. Um, hard but still beautiful um, and then we're going to do an analysis of the poem and it's probably going to be a long one um, there are other videos online that will likely be shorter but if you want a short analysis this one is probably not for you um, sorry I'll try not to be too verbose but I probably will be so Gerard Manley Hopkins, British poet, um, born in the 1840s. He, even as a young boy, he was particularly good at writing. His father was a poet as well um, and came from a very artistic family. So um, painters and writers within the extended family. Um, he went on to study at Oxford, which is quite a big deal. Um, and at Oxford he was quite torn about the fact that he was becoming a socialite and he had quite a swing away from that and decided that he would give up poetry. So he first started by giving up poetry for Lent, which is an interesting idea because during Lent you give up things that you love and you give up things that are potentially temptations and he gave up poetry. And later decided to become a Roman Catholic um, and to become a priest, which didn't sit well with his Anglican family. So many of them became estranged from him during his life. Um, and about a year after he finished studying um, and before he went to study for the priesthood. So he studied classics, Greek and Latin classics. But before he went to study in the priesthood, for the priesthood, he burnt all of his poems, bonfire, gone, um, and I just think that's, as a creative person, that is quite something to do, and he didn't write for another seven years, he just was like, nope, not going to do it, and for seven years he didn't write anything, and it was actually priests, other Jesuit priests, who convinced him to write again, and a lot of his writing is deeply religious, um, it's in this particular poem, it explores his role as a priest, but I think also it explores his relationship as a man to Felix Spencer, the man who was in the poem, the man who actually died. Um, so this particular poem was written while he was a priest and he was his parish was in Liverpool in a slums. Um, and he said of it that it was a particularly museless time. So he was uninspired. He only wrote three poems when he was in this space um, and, and a very hard space to be in, a very difficult space to be in with all the poverty and the suffering that he was around constantly. Just before I tell you about Felix Randall, Felix Spencer, it's worth just looking at one or two other ideas. He studied Greek and Latin and he got firsts for those, like incredibly intelligent, learned man. Um, and he went on to teach, he became an expert in Greek language and literature. So why is this important? And there's something else that's important, which I want to look at. He also learned Old English. So he has a very keen sense of the etymology of words. And that's going to become important in our poem, particularly when we look at things like random grim forge, um, because he's not using the 
modern meaning of the word random. He's using the old meaning of the word random. So it's important to keep those things in mind. He uses um, archaic language. He uses dialectical language. So there's even though he, this poem is really difficult to understand and the language is incredibly dense, within the poem he's actually using Liverpudlian slang. He's using slang from Liverpool at the time. It's just flipping hard for us to recognize because it's no longer slang for us in a sense. I mean, it's 220 years old, if my math is correct, my math is correct. Um, and it's also embedded within this very difficult to understand language, the way in which he structures his sentences, the way in which he puts ideas together are not straightforward. It takes quite a lot of sifting and digging to get to the meaning behind it. Um, and then a last thing that I wanted to look at before we look at the at who Felix Randall was is that his his concept of inscape. So he had this idea that everything is charged with its own essence. It's the the thing about it Every, every being, every person, every object has something about it that is singular and that holds all the energy of that being. So he was very interested in appreciating the particularity of a thing. And this, so this notion of inscape, I think, is what we're going to see when he starts describing Felix Randall. Um, he is enraptured as it were by the particularity of this man's beauty so what's interesting also about this poem and in terms of it being about felix spencer it's essentially a poem about a working class man in liverpool a farrier someone who makes shoes for horses you don't you know it's it's, it's an uncommon thing to have this incredibly beautiful poem about. So it's written about a real man. It was a man, Felix Spencer, who died in his early 30s um, in Liverpool. And Gerard Manley Hopkins was his priest. He gave him the, um, he, the anointment of the sick. He um, helped him come to terms with his death. He officiated at his funeral. So real man, and for, for all intents and purposes, the speaker in the poem is Gerard Manley Hopkins. He's a priest, and we, we can see it as, as him speaking. So in terms of the structure, we have a Petrarchan sonnet. What's a Petrarchan sonnet? An Italian sonnet. You've got 14 lines made up of an octave, which is this section here. It's got the two um, quatrains, four lines each. And then you've got the sestate, these six lines here, which is made up of two tercets, these stanzas of three lines each. And in the middle, typically, and this is why it's important to know that this is an Italian or a Petrarchan sonnet, is the volta. So what does the volta do? The volta introduces a shift in thinking, a shift in idea. And we're going to see in a sec what that volta is and why it's important to know this. Um, unlike most Italian or Petrarchan sonnets, this is not iambic pentameter. Um, what it is, is sprung rhythm, which is something that Manny Hopkins actually came up with himself. So instead of having a line of 10 syllables, that essentially goes from unstressed to stressed. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Did you see me counting? I think I got to five. So instead of having a line like that, what you've got is something where you're not counting the syllables, you're counting the stresses. And so it's the stresses that determine how long the line is, and he's not counting the sections that are unstressed. So you could have a line, and some of them are set counting the first eight lines, like there's a 19-syllable line, there's a 12-syllable line, there's a 16-syllable line. He's not counting the syllables, he's counting the stresses. And part of the reason I'm going into that is because part of the reason, one of the things that attracted him to this sprung rhythm is that it approximates speech. And I think he's considered a forerunner of the modernists, um, a forerunner of free verse. 
even though he is still working with stresses, um, he's not working with syllables and he is working with rhyme and he is working with the um, sonnet structure. The fact that he used the sprung rhythm, we always, we typically associate free verse with meandering thought, with somebody thinking through something. And I think the sprung, sprung rhythm here works in that way. We'll see evidence that it seems, especially in the beginning, that he's actually talking to somebody, he's responding to someone, the speaker. And then the, the sprung rhythm allows for this interior thought process to, to go on. So what's the basic idea with the poem? It, the poem chronicles the death of Felix Randall. So Felix Randall dies and it's a man that the priest, the speaker, has looked after while he was dying. He died, I think I mentioned this, of tuberculosis. And initially he was um, struggling with the fact that he was dying, the cursing. But then he came to accept his death through the priestly ministrations of the, the speaker of Gerard Madden Hopkins. And then in our Volta, what we see is we see it go from a poem where Gerard Manley Hopkins is referred to as he in the third person. And here we have um, from the Volta, thy, thy. So from third person to second person, from, from somebody that he's talking about to somebody that he's talking to. And so what we see in that shift, what we see in that Volta is a movement from the priestly duties the, the sort of official duties of the speaker into a personal connection between the man, the speaker, and the man, Felix Randall. And it's, it's quite a beautiful connection. It's quite a touching connection. Um, certainly one that is beyond what would be considered the normal connection of a father, a, a priest, to their... Um, a member of their flock, a member of their um, congregation. Um, and it just, it shows this incredibly beautiful moment in that third stanza of how it is that the speaker comforts this dying man on a personal level, not just as a priest, so beyond the priestly duty. And then in the final stanza, we're looking at the speaker's deep admiration for Felix Randall in life who he was and what he was in life and it's for for my thinking it is there is that um that inscape that charged essence the absolute singularity of each thing that gerard manley hopkins is describing about felix randall in that last stanza so that's the structure we're getting into the vocab it's rough um and yeah the, the this video is going to take a while but I do think I think the poem's beautiful I think it's I think it's definitely worth it so let's jump in um a farrier is someone who shoes horses a blacksmith Felix Randall is a farrier mold in this sense it's it's a especially in metalwork even in pottery you create a mold and you fill the mold in and you work from that mold um, it also, on a um, figurative level, suggests that Felix Randall is, is something of a perfect man because he's the mold. He's the mold from which other men are made. Um, hardy means to be strong, um, to be able to get through difficult situations. It also means to be bold or brave. So there's definitely admiration that we're going to see in these opening lines. Pining, I have seen some um, analyses online where they, they look at pining as a longing. Um, but I don't think, maybe it means that here, but I think rather the meaning is instead the, the losing of health, the losing of vitality, um, to languish. And it's it's generally a sad process when that happens. So, so pining is this man just sort of ebbing away, becoming less and less of himself. I think we could see him as yearning, 
But I don't think it really makes all that much sense in the lion to see Felix Randall as yearning. At least it's not discussing what he's yearning. Maybe he's, what he's yearning for. Maybe he's yearning for his lost life, but it's certainly not, the word is not connected to that in the lion. Rather, we're seeing a description of his illness in the lion. So the pining in terms of losing vitality, losing vigor, seems to make a lot more sense. Reason um, is your ability to think and to logically understand things. Rambling is to proceed without purpose. Um, so his ability to think was no longer coherent, no longer logical. It just sort of rambled all over the place. Fatal four disorders. Okay, so at the end of the video, I'm going to come back to something here about these fatal four disorders. Um, essentially, the, the one main reading of this is, is that especially with Gerard Manley Hopkins having studied Greek and Roman classics, that what you're looking at is the idea of humorism, which is that our, according to the Greeks, our health is governed by four different humors. All of those things were meant to be in order in the body as soon as you had one of them that was not in order so you would have disease we can understand it on a basic level as he has multiple things wrong with him in his body fatal um, these things are going to kill him we can also understand it as referring to the to humorism to this idea of the humors the four humors but i think there is another interpretation that i prefer that i'll get to at the end because i'm not sure if it would be accepted in a matric context fleshed there um, in this context flesh just means that these disorders these things that are wrong with him are housed in his flesh housed in his body to contend is to fight in this context so these disorders are fighting each other so we get a sense of just how diseased he is just how sick he is cursed here is it's not really too i don't think it means he's swearing like using vulgar language which is one of the meanings i think it suggests a a cursing of god or a cursing of life uh, a cursing of religion um so the sickness breaks him and he's cursing at these things anointed in this instance it's a sacrament from the catholic church anointing the sick so that their sins can be forgiven so that they can die free of sin and go to heaven um, and it's very much something a priest would do it's it's not something that a lay person or just any person would do it's something that a priest does um, it's so it's it's preparation for your soul for the eternal life for the afterlife okay, seven months earlier our sweet reprieve and ransom it, it actually it refers to Christ's death um, and the idea that Christ died in order to um, relieve us of original sin so that the word reprieve actually means to cancel the punishment of something so within Christian belief it's the idea that Christ died to cancel our um, original sin and to ensure that we would all get to heaven and the ransom is Christ is the ransom so if you uh, I think it's a, a one of the things that I was reading up about this the, the biblical verse the reference is Matthew 20 verse 28 and Jesus said that he came to give his life as a ransom for many so he the the, the price is Christ's life and what we get is is our eternal life so the reprieve and ransom is the promise of eternal life that Christ offered to us the word tended here is to present something but I also think that it's specifically chosen it's to present or to give something but I also think it's specifically chosen because of the the meaning of the word tender as gentle as well so I think it's because it's got those connotations I think it was chosen so it's a giving but I think Hopkins wanted it to also suggest a gentle giving in dears is to make something dear to you you love something you you um 
to cause to become beloved or admired. Quenched is to satisfy one's thirst by drinking or to extinguish a fire. It's essentially to put out or to extinguish something um, or to cool something. Um, in this case, it's also to, to end his tears, to stop his tears. Forethought is the ability to consider your actions in the future, to use good, good judgment for the future. If you are boisterous, you are energetic and rough and rowdy and loud, a little bit out of control. So the word random is not um, our meaning of the word random. It's not something that happens without thought or without conscious decision. So I don't know, the plane randomly dropped out of the sky. Like it, it was this act that had no intentionality behind it. In this instance, it's it's got to do with the etymology of the word, the old English meaning of the word, and it it derives from the from ideas of speed, and haste, um, and violence. But I don't think I don't think it's so much the idea of violence that Hopkins is getting to here as as more the physicality of the word, um, so velocity. And, and, you know, this idea of rushing towards something or um, to run at a fast gallop, which I suppose would also connect to the idea that he's talking about horses or he's talking about a, a farrier. Um, but it's, it's, it's a sense of powerful movement and fast movement. So this, this random grim forge, it's not a random, like we use the word random, it's, it's a place where there is movement and speed and force and power. The word grim here, um, also the, the Middle English, the, so the etymology of the word, the history of the word, you're looking at things like fierce, savage, terrifying, violent, severe. And I wouldn't play too much on the violence. I think it's it's more the physicality of those two words that he's getting at. I do still think he meant it to intend um, dark or bleak, which is the, the meaning of the word grim that we understand today, because a forge is dark, and I'll explain what a forge is in a sec. But I also think that those two words in particular, random and grim, it's about the power of the space, especially because of the way he describes Felix Randall as this incredibly powerful man. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, forge. It's where a blacksmith makes things. So you've got a fire, you're going to heat metal, you're going to uh, smelt metal. Um, and you're going to, it's noisy, it is going to be dark, um, there's going to be a lot of fire. Um, amidst is among or being surrounded by peers, people that are your equal in standing. And the word fetal, okay, so didst, sorry, didst is did. And the word fetal is one of the, the Liverpudlian sort of dialectical expressions. So one of the not quite slang expressions, but the sort of common expressions from Liverpool in the 1880s when this was written. Um, so a couple of places where they are, um, is he dead then? That then is fairly informal. God rest him all road, everything or everyone he offended. Um, and then fatal here is to make um, and to to add the finishing touches to. So it's, it's, it's to make, I think, the implication or the connotation being in a relatively skillful way, because you would also use the word as you're in fine fatal, you're in fine mood or fine, um, you well kitted out. So to make in a skillful way and to add the finishing touches. And then a dray horse is a draft horse. I'm going to put up a picture of a big draft horse because they are magnificent. Um, and again, I think it's important that it's a draft horse, a dray horse, some a, a horse that pulls a cart. And it's not just a riding horse. It's an incredibly strong horse. Again, referring back to Felix Randall and, and his strength. And then his bright and battering sandal. So to batter... Interestingly enough, also a word with connotations of violence. It means to beat, 
to beat a person, to beat a thing, but it's the sandal that's doing the battering. So almost like a paradox, um, because a sandal is, is quite a delicate, quite a flimsy shoe. And I've tried to wrap my head around why the flip a sandal, um, it just seems rather odd, rather random. It's obviously not rather random. I think it's also got to do with Hopkins' study of um, the classics, his admiration of Greek and Latin, um, the idea of a sandal being not sophisticated, what is the word I'm looking for, but being sort of something elegant. There we go. So the sandal here is something elegant rather than a flip-flop or flip-flops that you'd wear to the beach. Um, it's suggesting that this incredibly powerful horse is wearing this really beautiful shoe. Okay, vocab has taken a long time, but I think that when we go through the poem, it's going to make it a hell of a lot easier to understand what's going on. So let's start with the first stanza with the analysis. Felix Randall, the farrier. Oh, is he dead then? My duty all ended. Who have watched his mould of man, big boned and hardy, handsome, pining, pining, till time when reason rambled in it, and some fatal four disorders fleshed there, all contended. Few things to look at. The farrier here is like an epithet, so it's it's like a label, it's it's almost like a title. Felix Randall the Farrier, not Felix Randall anyone else, the Farrier. This is that quintessential essence of Felix Randall. Oh, is he dead then? It's a beautiful phrase. The O oh is a lamentation, it's a it's a cry of mourning, but the then is colloquial. So what's going on here then? You know, that, that sort of little added bit on the end of a sentence. Oh, is he dead then? And it makes it sound as if the speaker is responding to someone who's just told him this news. So the first two stanzas in particular, especially because of the third person reference to Felix Randall, he, they are far more sort of professional um, this is the speaker thinking about contemplating his professional duty. My duty all ended. And what did his duty encapsulate? What was his duty about? It's those next three lines. His duty was watching this beautiful, this beautiful, handsome, strong, robust, big boned man, this man who is a mold of a man because he is the perfect sense of what a man should be physically his duty was watching him diminish pining pining becoming smaller frailer weaker till time when reason rambled in it and his hopkins use of alliteration is astounding so who have watched mold of man big boned hardy handsome pining, pining, even though it's a repetition of the same word, till time, reason rambled, uh, fatal four disorders fleshed there. Yeah, just the sound of the, the rhythm is so beautiful. So part of his duty was watching Felix Randall diminishing, becoming less than, watching as he lost his reason. His reason lost its way, he lost clarity, he in essence lost his mind. And yeah, I'm going to come back to two things in this stanza, but one of them is the fatal four disorders. So we can understand that at least initially as the, the four humors that are out of sync. So he, he has these, the inside of his body, those, the, the blood, the bile, the yellow bile, I can't remember what they all are, but they all contended, they're all fighting. And so he is sick as a result of this. And this idea that they are those fatal four disorders are flesh, they are within his body. So this is part of what the speaker has done. Part of what he has done is stood there and watched. Um, and the who have over here refers to the speaker. It refers to Gerard Manley Hopkins. And so we have these two 
rhetorical questions and I'm going to come back because that's part of what I want to come back to at, at the end my my sort of theory according to me that I wouldn't necessarily take into a matric exam but which I think is really interesting so our second stanza we've got this incredibly long sentence as our opening stanza note that that is not capitalized the my over there is not capitalized so that is one long sentence and then our opening of the second quatrain the second stanza sickness broken three word sentence short hard the reality of this as well and this idea sickness almost personified as something capable of of literally breaking this man breaking his soul breaking his spirit and how in essence, how did it break him? Impatient, he cursed at first. So that cursing is not simply he was swearing because he didn't flip and want to die. He is cursing God, he's cursing religion, he's cursing his fate. But then he mended, he was restored because he was anointed. He was given the anointing of the sick, that um, anointing that ensured that he would be forgiven his sins that he would go to heaven and so this allowed him to mend and this is part of the speaker's duty part of his priestly duty but he also says though a heavenlier heart began some months earlier so actually he was mended because of the anointing of the sick but he actually began to to sort of walk that path that spiritual path earlier because the speaker, the priest, had given him, had tended to him, and we spoke about the duality of that word, the, the connotations of tended, given, but also in a tender way, in a gentle way, he'd given him the, the Eucharist, the sweet reprieve and ransom, Christ, the, the idea that Christ has died for our sins. And so we see that Felix Randall had begun a heavenlier heart, this idea of he, his, his soul, his heart had become more and more connected to God and finally mended with the anointing of, of the sick that he received. And we looked at this, oh, is he dead then? That colloquial sound. Another one is here, being anointed and all. So the, the rhythm, as much as the language is dense, as much as the words are dense, a lot of the rhythm of the language is colloquial. It comes from um, the, the Liverpudlian slums of the, 18, the late 1880s. And again, ah well, as if the speaker is accepting his death. So here we're not talking about Randall's acceptance of his own death. He had come to accept his death. This is part of the duty that the priest had and part of what the priest gave him is, is this ability to accept his death, to mend, to spiritually mend. But here the ah well is an acceptance on the part of the speaker. Ah well, he is dead. Ah well, there's nothing I can do. God rest him, all road, ever he offended. And the all road here is again, it's that, that colloquial language, that Liverpudlian dialect. Ah well, God rest him, all road, ever he offended. In essence, a sort of wish for the dying, that, or the, a wish for the dead, that he is forgiven his sins. He's forgiven his sins of offending against, sinning against anyone else. So that is our octave, those eight lines. And it's the priestly duty of the speaker, and it's speaking about Felix Randall in the third person, the he. And we get a sense of, of someone responding to what someone has told him. So the speaker is responding to the news of Felix Randall having died. And this is very much, ah, oh, well, God rest him, all road he, ever he offended. It's very much a sort of public statement that a priest would make. You know, I, I pray for his soul, or the kind of dutiful thing that a priest would say or do. And then the volta, and then the shift. And the shift brings us into that this was not simply a man that the speaker attended. This was a man, well, this was not simply a man that the speaker attended on his deathbed. This was not simply a sense of duty that the priest speaker went through. This was a man who touched him on a very human, very personal, very emotional level. And we see that shift particularly 
with the introduction of the the and the thy um, and the thou. It's pretty difficult saying the 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 thy the thou. Anyway, so what what is not apparent to us at all um, is that we don't necessarily realize that the thou and thy is far more informal than you. Um, for Afrikaans speakers, it will make sense if I tell you that you is the old English equivalent of i, and thy and thou is the old English equivalent of ye. So there's a, a pretty big distinction there. The the i in Afrikaans and the u in Old English are used to signify respect, a difference in rank. It's very formal, but the thy, thou, the, um, the ye in Afrikaans is, it can be used to signify a difference in social rank, but I don't think that's what's happening here. I mean, certainly there was a difference in social rank between these two men, but the Old English thy can also be used to show a emotional, personal connection. So a husband and a wife, for example, would refer to each other as thee and thou. Um, because we are not used to it and because the only time we tend to hear it is in very old poetry or in Shakespeare, we tend to think that the thou, thy is very formal. It's not, it's the opposite. So that comes in, in the second line of that tercet. But first, let's look at the opening line to that two set. This seeing the sick endears them to us. Us too, it endears. So seeing the sick, working with the sick, it makes them precious to us. It makes us precious to them too, is the meaning of that line. Um, and it's after he says that. It's after the speaker acknowledges the preciousness of the dying man that he uses the thy and here he isn't speaking about Felix Randall he is addressing Felix Randall and he said my tongue had taught thee comfort so we have both metonymy and synecdoche in that idea of my tongue had taught thee comfort metonymy Actually, let me start with synecdoche. Synecdoche is part for the whole. So the tongue here stands in for the whole person. Um, and the tongue as metonymy stands in for the words. My tongue had taught thee comfort. So the things I said to you gave you comfort. But now look at the use of the word tongue. Why did he not just say my words taught you comfort? The, the idea of tongue, especially when we have touch over here and touch over here, it becomes far more personal, far more of an emotional connection here. Um, so my tongue had taught thee comfort, touch had quenched thy tears. And it seems, even though there isn't a um, possessive adjective in front of touch, it seems to be, my touch had quenched thy tears. So my physical contact with you was what had stopped your crying. And this is beyond what, what a priest would ordinarily do. This is a moment of, of intimacy, a moment of deep comfort that the speaker as a human being, as a man, is able to offer the dying. The, the Felix Randall within the poem. And here we see this, this reciprocity continued. So there's this, in the opening line of that two set, there's this idea that um, the sick are endeared to us and we are endeared to them. So it's reciprocal, okay? And here we see this reciprocity again. My touch, I think the my is implied, had quenched thy tears thy tears that touched my heart so again that reciprocity here it is not a one-way street it is not simply as a priest that the speaker needs to perform his duties and he needs to you know give to his parishioner give to the member of his flock he is deeply affected as well and here in the my heart child felix poor felix randall 
the child is very much indicative of the relationship between a priest and a parishioner but it also says something about the deep care that the speaker has for this man um, something that I find interesting and it's, it's outside of the parameter of the poem or what you would have to uh, look at in the matric exam Gerard Manley Hopkins was a small man he was um, about five foot two, which is not tall at all. And here he's talking, he's writing about this huge, hardy, handsome Felix Randall, Felix Spencer. And he refers to him as child. So it's interesting that the shift in the relationship potentially, um, especially when we go into the, the last two set, the last stanza of the poem. But here there's, there's a sense of dependency where the dying man depends on the priest, depends on the speaker, almost as a child would depend on a parent. And then the Felix, poor Felix Randall. And I think this repetition of the name Felix, poor Felix Randall, especially just the, the, the first name, the first name without the surname, there's a closeness there, there's a um, tenderness there that suggests that close emotional bond between these two people in this incredibly difficult time where the, the priest is performing his duty, he's offering his, his help, helping this man approach death, and yet there's this beautiful close relationship that develops in that space. And our final stanza, the final two set, the three lines, is a reflection on what Felix Randall was like before he was sick and before he died. How far from then foresought of all thy more boisterous years when thou at the random grim forge, powerful amidst peers, didst fettle for the great grey dray horse his bright and battering sandal. So I've tried for ages to figure out exactly what that line means. I'm not 100% sure. Um, the most, what I do sort of come up with is that, okay, so foresight is your ability to think of the future. And, and on a general level, it sort of means um, when you were young, during your boisterous, energetic years, you didn't have foresight of this moment of your dying. And at that point, when you didn't have this forethought, when you were in the middle of your boisterous years, thy boisterous years, and you stood in front of the forge, and the random in the sense of uh, power and speed, and the same with the word grim, although there we, I already spoke about the fact that it would also include that dark and dreary. So when you were at this forge and it was... You know, there was this sense of power and movement and strength. And you were powerful even amongst people who were like you. So you were better than your peers, powerful amidst peers. And note the strong sound of that as well, the, p the plosive, powerful amidst peers. So when thou at the random gr grim forge, powerful amidst peers, didst fettle for the great grey dray horse you made, you perfected for this beautiful, big, powerful draft horse. And the draft horse, like Felix Randall, is big and impressive, his bright and battering sandal. And I think the sandal idea is an interesting one. I mean, the first time I read the poem, I was like, why the flip are you making a sandal for a horse? What, what's going on here? That's just ridiculous. In, in this love of the classics, there was also, at various times in history, a love of the way for the Romans dressed and a love of the way the Greeks dressed. So the sandal here is actually something quite elegant, something quite beautiful. And I think it suggests that the shoe that is made for the horse is elegant and beautiful. Um, and I suppose one way it looks like a sandal is, is a horseshoe sits underneath the horse's foot. And it's got those little sort of things that pin onto the shoe, like onto the horse's hoof like that. But it sits underneath. It's not a shoe that covers. And I think it, yeah, I think it's meant to indicate the elegance of it, the beauty of it. And it's, it's 
bright so you know the, the almost the lustrousness of it the shining of it and then battering the idea that it has this strength at the same time even though it's elegant um I think I've sort of run out of steam on that, but I hope I hope what is apparent in in the analysis is that shift from the priestly duty into first the emotional connection, the real emotional connection between these two men, and then the sheer admiration um, of Felix Randall when he was in his prime, and that that is how. Um, the speaker wants us to remember him. I just wanted to go back to that idea of Inscape. I'm just going to quote directly from the wiki entry on Gerard Manley Hopkins. An important element in his work is Hopkins' own concept of Inscape, which was derived in part from the medieval theologian Dan Scotus. Anthony Domestico explains, Inscape for Hopkins is the charged essence the absolute singularity that gives each created thing its being. In stress is both the energy that holds the inscape together and the process by which this inscape is perceived by an observer. We in stress the inscape of a tulip, Hop Hopkins would say, when we appreciate the particular delicacy of its petals, when we are enraptured by its specific, inimitable shade of pink. I think what we're seeing here is the inscape of Felix Spencer, this beautiful, big man, powerful amidst peers, as he's busy battering at the sandal, making the shoe for this horse, just this impressive, powerful man who made this incredible impact on the speaker and who, in dying, these two men forged this beautiful connection however short-lived it was. And then I've got a little bit of time left before my camera cuts out. It only films for 30 minutes at a time. So I wanted to just look at some of my other ideas, my other thoughts that I wouldn't necessarily take into an exam, um, but that I think are interesting. So I'm going to do them fairly quickly. So the first thing I sort of thought about is I think that that is a sort of public response and then I think that all of this is him musing to himself you know he goes oh is he dead then and that that sound of speech oh is he dead then and then here especially because the sound of speech is there oh well god rest him all road ever he offended I think that is a very public spoken response and I think this is him musing about his duty, internally musing about his duty. I can almost imagine that this was something that happened. Somebody told him, Felix Spencer has died. And he goes, is he dead then? Ah, well, God rest him, all road ever he offended. I also think that this rhetorical question where he says, is my duty all ended? I think he's pointing a finger at the fact that he was the only one watching Felix Randall dying. And the reason I think that is because of that word there, who have watched his mold of man. It should be who has watched his mold of man. If he's referring to himself, my duty all ended, who has watched, like saying, just the way, yeah, the way that the language works, I don't know if I can explain it particularly well. But to my mind, it sounds like who has watched would be if you if he were ex referring to himself in this context. But he's saying who have watched the plural, almost as if he's saying who has watched this man dying. Um, and the implication as a rhetorical question being none of you have watched him. I was the one who was there while he was dying. So that's just theory according to me. Don't take it into exam because I don't know if you could really prove it. Either of those two points. Then another theory according to me um, is the fatal four disorders. So here I want to go to something else because it's going to be pretty tricky for me to try and remember all of this. But essentially, there's an argument which I think is really, really interesting. 
Um, I'm just scrolling through all my notes to try and find it. There we go. So it's by a, a writer, Peter Whiteford, um, and he's asking what were Felix Randall's fatal four disorders. Just from the abstract of the article, this is what I've taken, is he says that, you know, he's not so, he doesn't really agree with the idea that what's being looked at are the the four humors. I'm actually just going to read from the um, abstract. The article proposes that a more coherent reading of the poem can be achieved if the phrase is taken as referring to the traditional four wounds of nature that were consequent upon original sin. The notion of the four wounds is illustrated from Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is a um, saint and a Catholic priest in whom the idea of disordering is unmistakable, with further connections made to Hopkins sermons and spiritual writings. So Whiteford is getting this from not just um, his idea of, oh, this is what Thomas Aquinas said, and it makes sense because Thomas Aquinas is a Catholic priest, a writer, and his writings probably influenced um, Hopkins, but also from the fact that these were ideas that influenced Hopkins sermons. So we, there's evidence of this. Um, and I thought what was interesting here is this ordering and disordering. So I'm going to read a couple of other things that I've found, and this is apparently um, from Thomas Aquinas, um, though it's come via another historian. There was a time when original justice enabled reason to have complete control over the powers of the soul, and when reason itself was subject to God and made perfect by him. But original justice was lost through the sin of our first parent. And he goes on to speak about how with our loss of reason, there are now these four sins that create wounds of nature. So he says, in so far as reason has lost the way to truth, reason has lost the way, reason rambling, okay, so reason was your ability to govern yourself, there is the wound of ignorance, that's one of these sins, in so far as the will has lost its inclination to good, there is the wound of malice, in so far as the irascible power has lost its aggressiveness towards the difficult, there is the wound of weakness. Finally, in so far as desire is no longer directed to the delectable under the restraint of reason, there is the wound of desire. These four, then, are the wounds inflicted on the whole of human nature by the sin of our first parent, Adam and Eve. So I think what we're seeing here is actually those four fatal four disorders, those are four sins, makes sense from a Catholic point of view, makes sense from the point of view of a man who's studied extensively, who's studied theology and philosophy, um, makes sense that these are sins that are fleshed, because what are the, the sins of Adam and Eve are when they realized they were naked, that they were running around in the flesh, as it were. So I think, yeah, I think that's an interesting reading. And part of why I think that reading is so interesting and why I think it offers more than just the humorist reading, the, the four humors, is because what it's saying here is that he was ministering the speaker was ministering to a man who was in a state of sin. The speaker was ministering to a man who was suffering because of his sinfulness, because he had no hold on his reason anymore. The sickness broke him. And it's through the anointing, through the reprieve and the ransom that Christ offers, and through the act of tendering, gently giving these things to him, that he was able to find God. And I think there's, there's something far more powerful in the thought of ministering to a sinful person, not judging, but helping that sinful person reach God, helping that sinful person reach um, heaven and an eternal life after that. I think there's something quite beautiful about that. The notion of performing, it's, it's a duty that a priest must perform, 
but it's an incredibly powerful duty it's an incredibly humbling duty you know to be able to help someone shed their sinfulness um so i'm not sure if that would be accepted at a matric level i think it should be i think there's enough evidence for it um but yeah hope you enjoyed hopefully i didn't ramble too much because i do i do get quite enamored of this man's writing i think it's incredibly beautiful yeah i never know how to end off the videos but yeah i'll try and do another one soon good luck with your studying